We're live. <laughs> hey, folks, come on in here. We're excited that you are with us tonight. <laughs> oh, I was just being warned by the pastor not to cuss or do anything wild and outrageous here. You not what happened. <laughs> At all. Joseph Reeves, welcome. We are glad that you are with us tonight. <sighs> That's not what happened at all. You're the worst. <laughs> uh, so in other words, I can cuss and do wild and inappropriate things, which always makes these things more interesting uh, and a lot more fun. I love yeah, people, uh, when I get to host things, it's like a gamble, right? You never know if I'm going to go left, I'm going to go right. You just never know. Am I going to go spiritual? Am I going to go? You just never know. And the mystical is what takes me. When you go down that mystic rabbit hole, I'd be like, oh, he is back. Here we go. Yes. You know, just never know. People are like, all right, guy, I'm going deep this time. Just, just stick with me. I try to give a warning, okay? I was like, hey, this is where I'm going. So, <laughs> yes. Hey, Welcome, in, folks. Welcome in. This will be interesting tonight. Uh, and it will definitely be informative. I'm excited for this group. I'm excited to talk to these folks on the screen. Yes, yes. Leslie. Come on Aqu in, Leslie. Aquilina. Aquilina and Angela Boyd. And of course, Queen. Right, Queen. Queen been giving me a hard time. Now, how Queen gonna take? You know, Queen took a little break. She told us she just took a little break from social media. How she come back in day one? She on me. She, <laughs> I'm talking about she. She trolling me from like you, you ain't you ain't take time in your off time to reflect on how you've been trolling me and maybe to think through all of the best ways. To troll you. That's what she did while she was gone. What are you talking about? That's what I would have been doing. Uh uh <laughs> Ain't either one of y'all saved. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, keep on started. working on it though keep on working you on know, it it's a normal know. Mm. <laughs> I know I'm not saved Chanel. I'm the only saved person on this panel I need to That's find it. me another panel I'm the only <laughs> saved person here I mean you the bishop right here <laughs> who, 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 made, who, who seconded that motion what did I'm saved yeah Girl, you know I'm saved. Don't be trying to act like I ain't saved. Oh, Lord. Saved by his power divine. Right? Listen. Like, ain't none of us saved, and you're the only one saved. You got the, the saved hands, you know, which is, looks, yeah. Yeah, it's I'm like, like serving. Serving. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, did y'all see Dewan's comment on the post in the fellowship hall? <laughs> When Celeste, Celeste posted a before and after picture of this family, it was a mother with her three daughters when they were young. Oh. And then she went back to the same beach with her three children. And now one of them was a trans man. So it was a celebration of this mother accepting all of her children as they are. Right. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So we're in the comments. <laughs> we're talking about this is beautiful. I'm not crying. You're crying. <laughs> Dewan gets in the comments and says, that trans man is fine. I said, uh, he said, I think I feel the homo ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Not the homo ghost. <laughs> oh, my God. Ah, I was laughing so hard. Like, dude. Please Ooh. go somewhere. He said, he said, I feel the homo ghost. I ain't never heard of such shenanigans in my life. Well, homo ghost is crazy. I love it. <laughs> that is a term for the ages right there. I'm about to add that to the book. Right. right. Like, put that in rotation. Right. Yes. Oh my gosh. <sighs> Seriously, somebody needs to take his phone. Absolutely, Janelle. Somebody need to take it. <laughs> <laughs> So many thoughts. <laughs> right. It takes you in so many different directions. It does. It does. It was like, am I allowed to say that? Because it's hilarious. <laughs> right? So like, I'm only going to say it when I tell he, that he said uh, That's it. There you go. Someone said, <laughs> Joseph Great. said Homo Ghost might have come from Duran Bernard. Well, look at Duran that. Duran said that. that. Look at that. We were just no, talking about Duran. Said, look, look, that's nothing but God. Mm -hmm. For real, that's for the homo ghost. For real, <laughs> honestly, here, right now, with us, right now, in this the homo ghost. <laughs> fall on us. Stop. Sat saturate the atmosphere. Yes, Lord, <laughs> Lord. Now you got me thinking in my list. Talk about sex brain because it's like yeah. 
up. Are y'all talking about God or something else? Like, what are y'all talking about? Y'all be singing right. all these songs that just be like right there. Like, Somebody. I don't know if Janelle meant what she just posted. Is that a typo? I need someone to post a good TFC thirst strap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a is that a typo? <laughs> like, see, this is what I mean. My mind goes. I love it. <laughs> Let's post them. Did, did you mean to say that, Janelle? Oh, yes. I can't do it. I'm telling y'all, the homo ghost is in this space. Oh my gosh, homo ghost field and KY jelly baptized. Oh, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not doing it. Y'all not saved. I need to I find me a I need, to, your church. I need to find me a saved church. <laughs> what is this webinar? Because KY Jelly baptized is, is wow. It, oh, another level. Um, Are we putting this on the internet? This is live. I, it's already here. The funny part is y'all were telling me to behave. It's already here. Look at your neighbor and say it's already here. It's already. <laughs> Come on now. Oh bullshit. Don't get me started. <laughs> I got the Holy Ghost and the Homo Ghost tonight. I'm on. Oh my God, all the ghosts. I've been had the Homo Ghost. <laughs> Honestly, <it's true. laughs> that's it. You better name it and claim it. Yeah. What you say? Oh. oh God, that's it. Oh man, I am undone. Y'all well, folks, uh, good evening, <laughs> and welcome. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> We're so glad to be here. Uh, you know, tonight is, I love Thursday nights, right? Because we always have some type of exciting program here at the Faith Community. Uh, and this uh, is, is no different. So tonight we are doing an intersectionally inclusive webinar uh, on the LBGTQ plus community and its inclusion in the Black church. Uh, and we are excited to, I am trying. Oh, why is your sh- little... Like reprimanding right. us. <laughs> what do we wait? What Please be say? serious. <laughs> no, we're not gonna be serious. You know what I'm this trying. is. I am listen. I'm trying to hold it in here. I'm just, I did you see how to change to the newscast, the voice, and everything. Uh, but it is it is 21 plus disclaimer. Okay, she said she did not know what she was getting into. Yes, right. Like I yeah, you yeah, I didn't know either. This is not how we planned it. I mean, it's all good. I'm talking about That's the whole outline, this one on it. This, this is a place where you can bring your whole self to church, okay? I'm uh, yeah, you know what? If you free and freaky, you can come right here. Come to the on. community. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad, uh, alarm. Where I'm is it? Check on. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's oh, good for me. God. That's Ooh. it. Oh, oh God. this doesn't, Jeremy. This doesn't mess with the grant, does it? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take this yeah. from these people here. They ain't going to ever work with us again. <laughs> <laughs> give us this back. Oh, my God. Oh, oh That's God. good, Doc. If you're free and freaky, my That's Lord. It. Come on what? in. Come on in the room. Mm. ain't mad at you. Liberated and lustful. That's yeah. it. That's what is wrong with y'all today? You know, you That's know, it. you know, I'm churchy. Ooh, I can't help it. Uh, no sense. That's right. my Jesus. It it's just, the realest it just, church you ever gonna find right here. Yeah, That's it just it. flows out of my belly like rivers of running water. I can't oh, help it. It just. Okay. <laughs> I, know, I learned. I had. In Some head, churches will weird. talk about it on speculation, but you know, God loves us with the evidence. Uh, <laughs> so I'm down well, for. It. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love it. I'm a I'm a mute, so I don't say nothing else. You, until just, so we, you, you know, this is a grant funded effort. Uh, we are doing this webinar tonight uh, in conjunction with the Black Church Equality Fellowship. Uh, Tyranny, would you tell us a little bit about the grant that we've received and uh, a little bit about the Black Church Equality Fellowship? Yes, I would love to. So we are working with Pride in the Pews. Pride in the Pews is hosting a fellowship program 
that Myron just, just named, the Black Church Equality Fellowship. And it is a distinguished nationwide leadership development program for Black faith leaders committed to advancing congregation-based programmatic initiatives that promote LGBTQ plus inclusion. And so they chose 10 churches um, across the United States who received a grant to do this type of work and have these conversations in their churches. And, and, oh, oh. Is it me? Am I echoing? What I do? What I do? I wasn't echoing. Oh, that's better. But y'all can still hear me though. Okay. Oh, yeah, but, you good. Okay. So um <clears throat> Yeah, they chose 10 churches um, in across the country to participate in this program. It's a nine-month grant cycle, so we've been working on this project from March of this year, and it wraps up in November. And so the goal is for us to continue having conversations about what it looks like for the Black church to become more affirming and more inclusive of our LGBTQ plus siblings and neighbors in how we increase our work in that across the spectrum. And so we went to Chicago, I went to Chicago in April and I go back in November to wrap it up. And it's been a really good experience. Um, Jay is also a fellow um, in the Black Church Equality Fellowship Program. And so that is where I got to meet them for the first time. So that was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about the program. I do have a introductory video that I would love to show you. You might see some people you know in the video, wink, wink. Um, so yeah. I am a Black Church Equality Fellow. The Black Church Equality Fellowship is a nationwide premier leadership development program for Black faith leaders interested in advancing conversation and action that advances LGBTQ plus inclusion. First of all, the people here could not have been picked by Jesus Christ himself to convene and become more conscious of the world that we live in. I'm more aware of just the larger scope of how we all fit in this society and how we should all be respected and loved. It's just an amazing opportunity to be able to pursue something, to do a project in order to bring awareness to the injustices towards Black LGBTQ plus people in the Black church. To go out and face oppression with colleagues, people who can see things and work with you, makes all the difference in the world in terms of your resilience um, and also can be very affirming. So I think what it does is it builds that bridge or that gap that says like you're a part of us too and you're not separate and you're not alone and we all deserve love and we all deserve to feel like we belong. This fellowship opportunity provides a safe space for pastors to have critical and crucial conversations, to ask questions, to break down myths and misnomers, to build fellowship and relationship with other people that are trying to do this work. It's very shocking to find that there's some things I had to wrestle with for myself. And so even through that and learning about another community, I found more acceptance and grace within myself. I can be a part of providing solutions for my congregation and serving the entirety of the community in ways that honor God and allow us to provide healing in hurting situations, no matter what they are. People can say these things and quote, mess up and there is not a fear of rejection or is not a type of harm to them. It's a matter of, oh, it's like I got your name wrong. You can mess up, you can get things right, you can think through, you can say what you're thinking through and what you're still processing in a brave space. Encourage your congregation to dig deeper, your staff, your leadership. So you should definitely apply so you can come, you can dig, you can learn and you can grow. We are intending this to not simply be a program, but a community wherein you might be able to come to again and again to build on resources, knowledge, and skill sets to meet your congregation and faith community where they are so that you might better serve LGBTQ plus individuals. Yay. So yeah, so that's a little bit about the program and a little bit about the work that we're doing. And I'm excited for us to be having this conversation. So Myron, I'm going to talk to you too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're excited to host this conversation uh, here at the faith community, uh, because the faith community is a, just a unique place. Uh, and it is guided and driven by our value proposition our living value proposition, and we call it a living value proposition because uh, it really does guide who we are. It is our, here we go, folks, our raison d'etre, uh, our reason for existing, right? Uh -uh, not, no, not tonight. This is a webinar. This is not Holy Smoke. So 
I am paying nothing uh, tonight. Uh, it is our raison d'etre. It's our reason for existing. Uh, and so I, I, I want to talk about that living value proposition. So Tierney, if you could give us, or Smith, give us the living value proposition. Oh, you want me to say it? Yeah, say it. Now nah, you, you, nah, you did not tell me this before we got on here. You know I have not memorized. In the folder. <clears throat> say what now? I put it in the brand folder. I got you. It's there. Oh, it's right there? Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody tell me nothing. nothing. No, my God. It, it, there there, there it, it is. is. So, so you help write this. So if you would give it in your, you know, good. Yes. This is, voice. this is our living value proposition. The faith community helps the unchurched, underchurched, and overchurched find meaningful ways to critically and holistically connect to the divine and heal by creating a welcoming, engaging, and intersectionally inclusive space rooted in the greatest commandment so we can live our lives in the most abundant way possible. I love that. Thank you, Smith. As you can see, intersectionality uh, is a part of who we are uh, as a community. And so tonight we want to focus a little bit on that idea of intersectionality. Uh, and to that end, we have invited the folks that you see on this screen to have this conversation. Uh, so folks, let's start off. If you would introduce yourself, uh, tell us uh, how you identify gender and orientation wise. Uh, and then your first question is, tell us about your experience with the black church. So uh, Jay, if, we, if you don't mind, we'll start with you. Amen, saints. Amen. <laughs> well, yes. Thank you, Myron. Uh, thank you to the faith community for having me here. My name is Jay Davis. Um, my pronouns are they, them. I identify as a non-binary uh, trans person. Um, I hope that was it. You know, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, well, yeah. So, tell us about how I, you get into the black church. My Lord, I grew up in the black church, um, deep in the South, uh, I'm from Mobile, Alabama, and I grew up Southern Baptist. So my church is what I call a generational black church, meaning my grandmother and her siblings went to that church. My, and then their children went to that church and I grew up in that church. So everybody has watched everybody grow up and, um, when I went there, I haven't stepped foot in that black church in such a quite a long time. And I think it's because of my identity, right? I always have this tension that I sit with whenever I step foot within any black church. Um, there was a recent time where I went to a black church this past summer, um, two summers ago. And that was the first time I still fit in a historical black church. And I could have sworn I got a lot of stares, right? People didn't know how to identify me um, or where to place me on a spectrum, on a binary spectrum, right? Male or female. Um, from the back, I've been called like, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And then when I turn around and they see me, they're like, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm like, actually, I live in the in-between, so I'm good. Um, so, yeah, that's been my experience with the Black church. I love the Black church. Um, but I'm not sure the black church fully can accept all of me or love me fully. So that's been my experience. Thank you for sharing that. What an interesting dichotomy, right? To to care about a place uh, that's not necessarily as invested in you, right? Uh, again, letting us know there is so much work to be done, especially on the intersectionality front. Uh, Tyranny, I am going to come to you. Talk to us a little bit about who you are, how you identify and your experience with the Black Church. All right. Hey, everybody. So um, I'm Tierney. My pronouns are she, they. Um, I identify as a cisgender woman, but not like those kind of girls. You know, like the girls that be like, I only wear pink. I always do my makeup and I wear six inch heels all the time. Come, you know, join us to be one of the girlies. I don't identify as like one of the girlies, but I do identify as a woman. So, you know, if that makes sense to help you, you know, put it into perspective. Um, and I'm queer. 
Um, and my experience with the Black church is I grew up in a historically Black missionary Baptist church in Macon, Georgia. When I was growing up, women couldn't step in the pulpit. You had to speak from the podium on the floor. As I got older, the women were allowed in the pulpit, but the queer people were only allowed to direct the choir. You couldn't teach Sunday school, Bible study, preach, do any of those things. But you know, you got the choir and the songs on lock. So, you know, do those things. Um, I love the Black church, like, like Jay said. Um, I still feel very, you know, committed to the work of the church. I think the church has a lot of work to do. I think, you know, some days it tries, some days it doesn't. It really grinds my gears. And I live in this very weird tension space as far as like this love hate relationship because I just we have the potential to be so much better we could do the things like we like if social justice and the things is what we say we care about we could really do the things but I feel like sometimes people just want to talk about doing the things they don't want to actually do the things and so that's where we get lost so yeah so that's a little bit about me and my experience in the black church Thank you, Tierney. I, and, and I think so many people in the chat identify with the fact that we're committed to the Black church, that we realize that this place has potential, right? And how do we move to actualize potential where we put this into practice, right? We move that into a kinetic space where it is active and it's moving uh, and pushing the world forward. Uh, Christian Smith, we're going to pass the mic to you, sir. Hey, everyone. Uh, Christian A. Smith. Uh, he, him, his. I am a cisgender, heterosexual, black man. Uh, my experience with the black church up until about, I want to say nine years ago, was marked by privilege. Uh, I was privileged everywhere I went in the black church uh, because of my identity. Um, and then on top of that, I have some gifts that the black church uh, values. So it was really easy for the black church to privilege me because I fit the black church stereotype. So I was not marginalized because of my identity. I wound up being marginalized because of my curiosity. When I started asking questions that made the black church uncomfortable that's when i started getting pushed to the side that's when i started getting disinvited that's when i started saying that people loved me to the extent that i agree with their theology and when they realized i did not share the same convictions that they felt theologically i was an outcast uh, so I tell people all the time now, you know, I, I, I post on social media and, you know, people who are unfamiliar with my ministry, but are in the same headspace, they see me and they say, man, they're going to banish you to hell for this one. And I'll be, I'll be thinking to myself, like, I've been doing this for eight years now. They didn't banish me to hell so many times. So I tell people, yeah, they already banished me to hell. So I decided to build beloved community there. And, and that's where we are. And that's what we're doing. Uh, and Smith, you are the founder of the faith community because of that conviction. Yes. Yes. It, it was it was a matter of um, <clears throat> if I'm going to do ministry the way that I feel I've been called to do it, the way that I feel I'm equipped to do it with the care and compassion for people that I feel within myself. Like I'm I'm only going to do ministry that way. And if there isn't a place for me to do ministry that's already established then I'll establish something on my own and see if it works, because if it fails, at least I tried. And if it works, who knows what impact we can have in the world? So. So here we are. I love that. Uh, and friends, that brings us to our conversation topic for tonight, this idea of intersectionality. Uh, so just a little bit of history on the term. It was coined uh, by a woman by the name of Kimberly Crenshaw back in 1991 uh, in Oxford Dictionary. Uh, defines intersectionality as this, an interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and independent systems of discrimination and advantage. A disadvantage, excuse me. I'll read that one more time. The interconnected nature of social categorizations 
such as race, class, and gender, as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and independent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Uh, it's, it's essentially overlapping systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Realizing that you can be uh, discriminated against in multiple parts of your humanity, right? Uh, so I I'm gonna ask you folks here on the panel, tell me a little bit about your introduction to intersectionality and how it is related to your life and to your ministry. Tierney, I'm gonna start with you on that one. I felt my name being called. I said, Myron's gonna be like, Tierney, you got the homo ghost tonight. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so my introduction to intersectionality in a formal way happened when I was in seminary. Um, I was also introduced to womanism there and looking at all of those things in tandem led me down the intersectionality rabbit hole. And so once I understood what it was, I realized that I didn't know the name for it, but it had always been a part of my experience, right? So I'm Black. I'm a woman. And those two things within itself leads to multiple intersectionalities. You think about socioeconomic status, you think about um, sexual orientation, you, then you keep adding and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And so once I understood what it was, I knew that it had always been a part of my life, even though I hadn't known how to name it or how to talk about it. And so, you know, you apply for a job or an internship and you like, okay, well, I don't want to wear my hair a certain kind of way and I need to wear a dress so I can present as feminine as possible in this corporate space. And I need to wear the heels and the pantyhose and do the whole shebang. And um, is it miss or is it Mrs.? And how are people like looking at you and interpreting you and all of those things? And so my formal introduction happened when I was in seminary and I understood it in an intellectual way, but after I processed it intellectually, I understood that I had been living it out all of my life. I had been living out what it looks like to be living in all of these different boxes at the same time. And all of them are conjun conjoining on each other at the same time. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's it's that we can be on the seesaw of liberation. Uh Right, that one area is progressing while the other one is going backwards, and then it, it goes the other way. Then one area progresses, and then the other goes backwards. Right, and it's this realization, uh, in the words of King, that a threat to injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, so that if I'm not free in one area, it really does it. It really does eclipse the freedom that I have in another area. So I, I'm hearing you there. Yeah, and uh, if I didn't bring my full self to the space, then did I really bring myself? Absolutely. Right. I don't want to segregate myself from myself. Christian's also a troll, but I'm not listening to him. That was good, Myron. <laughs> I'm just talking to y'all here. Smith, talk to us, Smith, about intersectionality, uh, how you heard about the term, your understanding of it, and how it relates to your life in ministry. First of all, are we not going to acknowledge this, that Tierney says she's worn pantyhose before in a dress? Like, <laughs> nobody nobody wants to see a picture of Tierney in a dress and pantyhose. Wah, wah. <laughs> Looking like an usher, right there. Come on now. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh man. So, um, my introduction to intersectionality was actually a little bit misguided, but helpful because sometimes I hear terminology and then I can like intuitively pick up on what it means to me before I go research it. So, like when I first encountered the term radical acceptance. I intuitively kind of picked up on that. And Pamela said, you should like really re research that because I think you would appreciate what that means in totality. So I went and researched it and my research confirmed what I intuitively picked up on. Intersectionality did not work that way. When I first heard the term intersectionality, intuitively, I thought of it as how different people have forms of marginalization that intersects with each other. So it helped me to connect to other marginalized people 
who didn't necessarily have all the same forms of oppression as me, but I connected my oppression to their oppression. So I'm not same gender loving, but I know what it's like to be oppressed for being black. And I can't do anything about being black. And I know how much it sucks to be oppressed for something I have no control over. So it helps me to make a connection to the person who is oppressed because of who they love. Because you can't do anything about how you show up in the world and who you love. So it helped me to find connection with other people. Then I went and actually researched the term and was like, oh, that's not what this means at all. But it was still helpful to me when I when I conceptualized it that way and in learning uh, the terminology and, and what it actually meant. Um, it was so helpful because it it, it showed me how um, people suffer oppression in so many different ways. And it revealed to me on deeper levels my own privilege because my blackness is a huge knock against me in this society. But it's the only knock against me, in, like especially in the church. We'll talk theologically, like the fact that I've, I've been the fat kid for most of my life. That's that's a knock culturally, but not as significant as my race and also, you know, my weight. That's really about self-image. If y'all haven't listened to the self-love for fat kids uh, episode of Holy Smokes, please go check that out. It's it's really worth the listen. Um, it was a lot of healing took place. So it helped me to understand when I when I understood intersectionality, I was like, oh, I got a whole lot of privilege because ain't nobody discriminating against me because of my gender or my sexual orientation or even my social economic status, because I grew up in a relatively middle class black family with both of my parents. So I was born into privilege. And that just really helped me to understand what people around me were going through, because it was like, what if I was like, what if I felt the oppression of my blackness four times over? I can't even imagine that. I, I love that you pointed out that the idea allowed you to be introspective. Right. And you weren't just able to identify areas of disadvantage. You were also able to identify areas of your own privilege. Uh, and so I think that is one of the benefits of the theory of intersectionality. Right. It causes us to look within so that we can identify the hats that we wear to find out, is this a hat that is a privileged hat? Or is this a hat that is a disadvantaged hat? And then how do we use that privilege to help the disadvantage? And if I can say, you're absolutely right. It's the introspection that I think separates um, this community in particular from a lot of other spaces. We really challenge people to be introspective. Like our theme at the faith community for 2023 is mining your own business. How can you dig into your own business and excavate whatever is down there so you can figure out how to navigate your own business? Because too frequently we're minding other people's business instead of mining our own. And when we mine our own business, it helps us to be better people to ourselves and to other people. And, and I think that's one of the things that we need to start focusing on more is how we can be introspective about our experiences and love ourselves more so that we can extend that to other people. Well, you know, that is that is a side effect, if you would, to the greatest commandment ideology. Right. Right. Because in, in, in I don't know if you all are familiar with Smith's concept of the greatest commandment theology which starts with loving the self before you can be an extension of love to anybody else, right? Uh, and if you recover the self, you've got to be introspective. You've got to think about yourself first before then it expands to everybody else. Now, Jay, I don't want you to think we forgot about you up there uh, because uh, awesome. we're coming to you. Uh, and I'm going to ask you the exact, oh, go ahead, Tyranny, you want to share something? Then, Jay, then we're coming to you. Yes, I let Christian get out his point because it was a very beautiful point. But you can't say excavate and talk about Myra earlier for saying some other word he said. Like you can't, you can't have it both ways. You can't do all of the things. Okay? Like, well, we let him get away with it, so <laughs> it's fair game now. It has to be acknowledged, okay? But I, but I needed to, you know, excavate, navigate. You see, I try to put that together, a little. Your preacher bag, you know, line right there. Fifty years of hip hop. Aha, come on, I can preach, okay? He want, he got a preacher spirit in him. We need some community fun work. Because right. the man does not want to preach, okay? Right, it's bubbling up on the inside. The man's got a word in his spirit. I, I, I got to get my preaching out one way or the other. 
My Lord. RJ, it is you. Talk to us about intersectionality. And Ooh. I said that word all wrong. I don't know how that came out. Intersectionality mm -hmm. uh, and how it relates to your life and ministry. Oh, wow. I uh, was introduced to intersectionality in both an informal way and a formal way, right? I think for me, I'll speak to the informal first. When I was in fifth grade, um, I was always allowed to watch BET, period. Um, and we ended up, I, a movie came on called Holiday Heart. And I'm not sure if people are familiar with Holiday Heart, but it is centers a um, black drag queen who is a Christian that plays the piano at his Baptist church, um, takes in, you know, a family and helps them out. And I, to me, the whole story to me centered around Holiday Heart uh, because I felt like I was Holiday Heart, you know, this black gay Christian um, drag queen. But I was only in fifth grade, so I really didn't understand why I was so in tune to this person. And it wasn't until I got into seminary where I was formally introduced to intersectionality um, through the lens of Marsha P. Johnson, right? This person who dwells deeply in the in-between spaces. Um, and so I look at Black people as being non-monolithic. Non uh, we, we can't hold... Uh, we are both and people, right? We live in in between, but so often we find ourselves in the either or. So for example, for me, I, um, when I step foot into the black community, there are parts of my queerness that are often, that I feel like I have to like put away. Uh, I don't, I show up fully. So, um, but there are parts of, you know, queerness I feel like I have to put away. And then when I step into the queer community, um, they're a part of blackness that I feel like I have to put away, right? Because it's it's heavily populated, you know, whiteness, um, in my opinion. But that to me is how I was introduced to intersectionality, that I have to like uh divide myself in order to please people around me. Um and intersectionality says I, I don't have to do that, right? I can just be who I am authentically. Um, but I do hold multiple parts of myself that makes up Jay holy, right? So I don't know if that makes sense, but no, it does completely make sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, now I want to I want to push you all a little bit further here and think about this in a church context, right? Uh, in a theological context. Right. So one of the things that has been proposed as a remedy for helping to deal with intersectionality is these ideas of liberation theologies. Mm. Right. And, you know, there are a slate of liberation theologies and all of you have studied liberation theologies on, on various uh, levels. So tell me, what's the relationship between liberation theology uh, and intersectionality uh, and how would they help people move forward? in identifying intersectionality or even remedying the problems that come uh, with marginalized groups? Do you want to toss that to somebody or you just want us to go for it? Well, I was giving you just a moment to think through it because I realize I'm I'm totally off script. Uh, mm. <laughs> so we, we know what to expect when Myron is in I want to give you a minute to just kind of sit with that. Uh, but Smith, since you spoke first. My Lord. <laughs> so <clears throat> and again this is completely off script so i'm i'm responding to this in real time but i, I really feel like um liberation is incomplete without intersectionality because if we only liberate a part of ourselves that mean the other parts are in bondage so we have practiced in the black church for a long time a partial liberation which has kept so many of us still in bondage. And, and actually all of us to a certain extent have remained 
in a certain level of bondage. You know, like it happens in compartments. It happens at levels <clears throat> like bondage doesn't isn't the same across the board. Right. Because you could be like take our our uh, criminal justice system. Right. You could be in a jail. You could be in a prison. You could be in solitary confinement. You could be on house arrest. Like it's all bondage, but it all plays out differently. Like house arrest is preferred to solitary confinement. It's still bondage, though. So we have freed ourselves from certain forms of bondage, but intersectionality invites us to free all of ourselves. And that is the connection for me when we look at liberation theology and intersectionality. Oh, you, you still muted that. Free all of yourself. I love that. Uh, Tyranny, go ahead. You wanted to add in. So my thought process is kind of close to what Joseph was getting at in the chat. They said, I think the notion of intersectionality has helped us drag liberation theology forward because liberation theology has historically been very segregated. And that's how I was thinking through it in my mind, because we have black liberation theology, which is very much giving black men. Right. And then we have black feminist theology, which is coming along and saying, yes, black liberation. But what about the women? And then we have womanism that comes in and it says, OK, yes. But what about classism? What about sexism? What about racism? We have to talk about all three of those at the same time. But then you have queer theology. You have um, anti-ableism theology. You have all of these other things. And as we continue to iterate, we continue to pull in the people that got left out in the beginning. So it's like building blocks, like we're building on each other. And so I think it helps us move the conversation forward because we're continuing to add people in and acknowledge who we who we, who we're missing, whose voice is left out. Um, and so yeah, so that's kind of how I was thinking about it. It's like a, a a staircase. We keep going up the staircase towards liberation for all people. We started we started good. We was like, okay, yes, we want liberation for these people, and we're like, wait, but we left somebody out. Wait, we left somebody out. Wait, we left somebody out. And so now we're trying to you know stairway to heaven. Mm, I hear that. Listen, I hear my black yeah. church. You know, we climbing Jacob's ladder. Come on now. It goes higher and higher and higher. Come on. Jay, would you like to add in on yes. that? Yes. Um, y'all gonna have to forgive me. I talk in I talk in uh films and art all the time. I got um, it. But I love that. I love it. <laughs> I am thinking about the obviously the scene that every woman is has ever talked about in Beloved, right? Baby Suggs in the clearing. And she, Baby Suggs is on this stoop and she's calling out to the men, the women, and the children. I think of that moment and she tells them to be their most authentic selves, right? To me, that ties in liberation theology and intersectionality. And it's a very queering moment in that scene, right? She's telling them to be their most holistic cells they've been brought up and they have been told to be one way and now that they're set free they don't know how to be right and I think that's the scary thing that the black church is like what happens if the black church becomes so free they just don't know how to be and so then we have to perform and conform to certain ways of being in order to like be accepted in society, which brings us to making those staircases of different theologies because we could have just had everybody included from the beginning, but instead we realized that we've left out so many people and we just don't, we don't know. We don't know how to be. And I think that scares the hell out of it. Sorry. Am I allowed to say hell? Go for it. <laughs> I believe that scares us uh, deeply. Um, and so I think to me, I think the black trans community, I think trans community in general, right, can show a lot, especially black queer spaces like ballroom culture, um, drag king, drag queen spaces, can really show the black church what it means to be liberated and how to live in your intersectionality. Yeah. Whew, that is so good. 
uh, that is so good, right? I am, uh, my mind is going a thousand different places right there, especially that idea of being, right? Smith, I know you wanted to add something there. I saw you pointing. So please go ahead and share what came up. Oh, I, I was just appreciating what Jay said, that, that statement about when we get free, we don't know how to be. It's like, because we've been in bondage for so long, so our entire lives have been shaped by bondage. Our entire identity has been shaped by our position in bondage for our whole lives. So when we get set free, we got to start all over again. What does it mean to walk in this level of freedom? And that's why a lot of people don't choose to get free because freedom is unfamiliar. And people fear what is unfamiliar. So even though freedom looks appealing, it's unfamiliar. I'm going to stick to what I know. So and, and that's what happens, which is why this journey is so profound uh, for, for people to go on a journey of theological liberation through the lens of intersectionality. It's a lot of work to figure out how to be. Oh, that's so good. I keep thinking of, when you say that word being, I keep thinking of the theologian uh, Paul Tillich, right, who essentially in his book, Love and Justice, talks about God being the ground of being and that being brings us closer to the divine. Right. He's he's famous for saying that God does not exist. God be right. That God just exists in God's own space. And so to attribute a title to God is to subtract from God because God just be. Right. I, and I may be doing Tillich justice. That's the, the Randall interpretation of Paul Tillich. Somebody can correct me uh, if you if you study Tillich. But uh, that that brings up that idea uh, so closely. Now, let me let me ask this. Right. So while we're talking about intersectionality, we're talking about liberation theologies. I want us to bring that back to the black church. Uh, And there may be folks that are watching us that come from different contexts that want their churches, that want their ministry spaces uh, to move along the spectrum of being more intersectionally inclusive. How do they do that now? I'm going to let you answer that question, but I want to let the folks in the chat know uh, that once they finish answering this question, we're going to come to you for questions so that if you've got questions, go ahead and start typing them in the chat now uh, so that we can bring those right back up uh, if you have questions. So give us some tips for the churches and for the ministries uh, that are watching right now, how they can push their ministries and their churches along that, that spectrum, if you would. Tyranny, I'm going to start with you. And I'm going to start with you because you're one of the fellows, right? And we saw you leading the group. Uh, Tiff, oh, whoa, whoa. Who's in charge. Uh, I mean, she looked like she was running things in that. And I, you know. Don't so, do that. Don't and do she that. was. See, and there we go, right? <laughs> First hand witness. And she was. We know and, when Tyranny is in charge. And it is established. There it, is. <laughs> it is. You, so. can't, you can't even deny it now. <laughs> I'll be quiet and answer the question. <laughs> Um, so I have a couple thoughts. One of them, the first immediate thought is to participate in programs like these. So the Black Church Equality Fellowship has another round of applications that will be opening next year. And it gives you community of people to have these conversations with, a community of people to bounce ideas off of. And so you don't feel like you're trying to do that work by yourself and starting from scratch and not knowing which where to go. So applying for programs like these, looking out, continuing education opportunities to do this type of work, if you're actually someone interested and committed to the work, I think that's a good place to start because trying to do this work in silos or by yourself can have you going in circles in your mind and you start you start thinking one plus two equal five because you literally don't have nobody else to bounce your ideas off of. And so um, applying for programs like this and doing this type of work in community is a good place to start. And then I think another thing that the Black church as a whole could do is start listening to the people that it often tells to be quiet or, oh, that was a good idea, but we're not going to do that at this time. Or she always got something to say. She always got a thought. They always asking questions. They always pushing the boundaries. All those people that you, they always, they always, and try and hush and put in the back pew in silence. Those are the people you need to be listening to. What are the children 
saying? What questions are they asking in children's church and in Bible study? When you when you read the scriptures and talk about the stories and see where God is, what are they bringing up? What's happening in their in their classrooms that's making them be like, well, you said I can't be friends with this person, but they had my back at recess. So I don't believe you. I believe them. Listen to the people that you are accustomed to not listening to. That's a very good starting point for the Black church as a whole. Oh, that is so good. Thank you, Tierney. I keep thinking um, uh, Reginald Sharp uh, is pastor of Fellowship Church in Chicago. He preached Sunday at a church in Houston uh, from that story of the man who had been at the gate or at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years, right? And he said, I have nobody to put me in the pool. And he said, we're always talking about and asking you know, this man, why would you sit here? Why would you be at this pool? Uh, and, and he said, that's the question we need to ask the people in the temple. Why was the man at the pool? Uh, it was because he wasn't allowed to be in the temple. <laughs> uh, and so maybe if the temple went to the pool, the people at the pool wouldn't need the pool. Uh, and so I hear you listening to those folks uh, who we have not listened to in the past, right? He said, I have nobody to put me in the pool. Uh, that wasn't a cry to lean on somebody. That was a cry for help. Uh, and maybe if somebody from the temple showed up, uh, somebody could have helped him get the deliverance that he was seeking the entire time. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Jay, you are also a fellow. Talk to us. Give us some tips. That was Reginald Sharp. That wasn't me. And I modernized it. Uh, and I gave <laughs> Reggie credit. So the next time I say it, uh, it's mine. So thank you, Reginald Sharp. Uh, you will no longer get credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was good. Um, I think the first thing is you have to build relationships, right? Um, and hearing the stories of the people, I'm pick, I'm piggybacking off of tyranny. Um, hearing the stories of the people, parent telling the narrative that has always been untold, um, and reshaping it. And then oftentimes I ask the question of like, I know with my project, I've I've asked the pastor that I'm working with, you know, can the black church go back to being trans? Or what does it look like for the black church to imagine? Can your church reimagine the image of God as a black trans person? And they have to sit with that, right? Um, because we're, we're talking about the least of us, right? We're talking about at the very minimum, hearing their story and building the, uh, relationship, um, going to those who are in your congregations that normally wouldn't go up for prayer or normally wouldn't go up to the altar call. Cause obviously they, there might there might be some fear there, right? That you're pro you're trying to pray something away, or anything of that nature. In reality, I just need prayer because I woke up, <laughs> you know. Um, so, I think with my project, I did something of building a curriculum that helps that provides inclusive language um, for their leadership team, and giving it to them and going from there. Um, so yeah, like it includes different narrative techniques and toolkits that they can use to help build them, build their congregation. So that's what I did. I love that kind of, I love that you also gave us something very pragmatic, mm -hmm. that learning the language, uh, learning to call people by the right term that they identify by. I remember, uh, what was this? Just a couple of weeks ago, Tyranny and I, uh, were in a meeting and uh, this group was walking us through uh, the LGBTQIA acronym and they added another uh, group in there, 2S, 2Spirit, which yes. are people who identify as having mm -hmm. a feminine spirit and a masculine spirit. Uh, and that thing, I went to go research it and that thing sat with me so long. And I'm coming back to what you said here about the church being trans. Um, this idea of two spirits, that's Jesus. Yeah. Right. That's the hyperstatic union, right? That Jesus identified as having two spirits, fully man, fully human and fully divine. Right. And so why not get back to that place of possibility mm -hmm. of people being what people are? 
right? Nobody believed Jesus when he said he was fully God and fully human. Uh, right. And so why? Why? Right. Let's get to a church that realizes that everything is possible and we are going to call people by what they identify with uh, and how they choose to identify. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jenny. Oh, Myron, what you said just made me think about something. I think another thing that the Black church as a whole can do is find its imagination again. Because somewhere it has gotten lost. Yes. I imagine a world outside of the world that we have seen or the traditions that we have done. I need us to press a hard reset and go back to the basics and open up our imagine our imagination again. We can imagine a church. We can create a church. We can create a world that looks different than the one that we're in that doesn't leave anybody behind. We don't have to always do things the way that we've always done them. So I want us to go find our ima imagination and get it back. Mm, I love that because you know what I realized that uh, the world is concrete, but our faith can't be. <laughs> our, our faith has to be a little bit larger than the world that we live in in order to deal with the world that we live in. And we've bought that concreteness to our pulpits and we lost our imaginative ability so that people can no longer imagine a future beyond the future that they're living in. Right. And we can't be afraid to be disruptive. Yes. Yes, go lean into that. Go ahead. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think we I think the black church is afraid to be um disruptive because we don't want to be too seen, right? We're already black. Mm -hmm. So if we lean into like our queerness, that's a little bit too much. But we can't be afraid of that. Yeah, I love it. I love that. Now, Jay, I'm going to offer you the last words here. Uh, I mean, Smith, excuse me, Jay, you just spoke. Smith, offer us the last words here about creating an intersectionally inclusive space uh, and what can other ministries and other churches do? Um, <clears throat> the first time I met my play cousin, Daniel Thomas, Unfit Christian, we had a conversation because we do similar work. Um both digital pastors who love the black church and kind of been outcast coming from different angles. And uh, Danielle told me how when people enter her space and start to engage her in the process of uh, deconstructing and decolonizing their theology, she generally starts with the topic of sex uh, because Danielle feels like if I can get you unstuck sexually, we can work through all the other stuff. And I was like, that's interesting because you start people with their beliefs about sex and I start people with their beliefs about scripture. Right. So I start with helping people unpack how scripture has held on to them. And both of our approaches work within our context. But what both of them require is for people to establish a willingness to unlearn wherever you start in moving towards intersectional inclusion, you must establish a willingness to unlearn before you can listen to the voices of people that you've normally not listened to. You first have to establish a willingness to unlearn before you can read the books and take in the information that you're reading. You first must establish a willingness to unlearn, because if you do not have a willingness to unlearn, that is where you will get stuck. Because the minute you are presented with information that does not align with what you have learned in the past, you will reject it. So you must first establish a willingness to unlearn. Ooh, I love this. You just felt like preaching right there, huh? So, folks, I, I, the floor is open if you have questions. And the first question, uh, Jay, is for you. Uh, somebody asked, would you go a little bit deeper and tell us what you mean when you say the church needs to go back to being trans? Yeah, that was my um, my thesis that I wrote on at Emory. Uh, but when I say can the black church go back to being trans, I'm essentially saying that, you know, we the Black church loves transformation, right? We've talked about the crucifixion of Jesus. We talked about the resurrection and we talked about the tomb. And the part that I stick to is the tomb. Like there was a transitional period within the tomb, right? Um, 
he goes in one way and then comes out another. Um, but we miss that. And then I think about the ways in which black bodies have often been, have always been queer, has always been trans. Um, I went, <laughs> in my paper, I went deeply into uh, chattel slavery and how we did not, um, black bodies didn't have a gender. We were just seen as enslaved bodies. We were property. We became gendered when we stepped into whiteness, uh, when we stepped into wanting to identify who we were. And that's very important in wanting to identify who we are as a people, but we lean so much into it as in terms of respectability politics, right? Um, and so that's where I went and that's what I mean. I hope that made sense. Yeah, that does. that does. Somebody also said, can I get a copy of that dissertation? Huh. I don't know if you published that yet, uh, but please do so. We definitely all want to read that. Uh, folks, I've got one more question for the folks in this panel. Again, uh, if you've got a question, throw it in the chat. Uh, and this one's rather personal, right? So you all have this, uh, and excuse the term here if it triggers you, uh, but you have this revelation, if you would, about intersectionality, uh, and how it relates to the Black church and how liberative theologies play into that. Here is my personal question for you. How does what you know affect your relationship with the divine? How does what you know affect your relationship with the divine? Smith, I'm going to start with you. It has drastically deepened my relationship with the divine, drastically, drastically deepened my relationship because I feel so much more comfortable being myself in the in the presence of the divine. I used to feel like I had to present a certain way in the presence of the divine. But in my most meaningful relationships, I am allowed to show up as myself. What I love most about my wife is that she allows me to be myself at all times. And. As I have discovered that the divine wants me to be myself too, I can't even put into words how much stronger my relationship with the divine has come. I love that. Jay, what about you? Your relationship with the divine, how has it been impacted by what you know? Yeah. Um, my relationship with the divine has been strengthened by what I know um, and by who I am. Um, I am not a biblical scholar. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I do love the Bible and I love the story of the transfiguration of Jesus being transformed and transitioned right before the disciples' eyes. And to me, that stuck with me um, because... It, gave, it was a clear defining moment as a trans person that I was accepted by Jesus, right? That Jesus and I can relate on that and on so many other things, but specifically being trans. And yes, to me, Jesus is trans and queer. Um, Jesus lives in the intersectionality in my eyes. And um, as a re relating to the divine, yeah, I think oftentimes I am just my I realize that my faith and my relationship with the divine is what saved me and made me come out. Um, because I was in hiding. I wasn't in hiding from God, I was in hiding from people. Um, so when I came out, God said, Well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> I may not read the Bible much, but I am churchy, so that's all right. That is all right with me. All right, Tyranny, tell us about your relationship with the divine and how what you know has impacted it. So when you first asked this question, I was like, huh, what do you mean? I don't understand. And then I was like, oh, OK. So I think the more I have come to know myself, the stronger my relationship with the divine has gotten. So the more I learn about who Tierney is, 
what Tierney likes, what Tierney enjoys, the things that bring me life and feeling free and authentic enough to live into all of those things. I've gotten to know the divine more and I've gotten to be in relationship with the divine more because I know myself. So I don't have to think all these things that other people told me about who the divine is, about who God is. I know for myself because we've built a relationship. And as I've come to know myself, I've come to know the divine that lives around me, that lives within me, that is in a combination of all of those things. So as I've come to know more about, you know, life and things, but as I've come to know more about myself, I've gotten a stronger relationship with God and the divine and all those things. So, yeah. I love that. Thank you all for sharing. And thank you all for joining us tonight uh, as we have talked about, uh, intersectionality uh, and how it relates to the church, how it relates to us personally, uh, and what we can do as a group, as a community, uh, to move the church forward. Thank you to this panelist. We also want to give a special thank you uh, to the Black Church uh, Equality Fellowship for the opportunity to partner with them and do this webinar. It is our hope that you have been blessed uh, and that you got something out of tonight. And I'm I'm sure I did. Uh, and I know you have as well. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for being here, folks. Peace.